Hey yo everyone, I'm here in Minecraft Java Edition 1.21.5 showing off my newest Mandelbrot set generator. Uh, so this generator is the one that I showed in my Pi Day episode a couple of weeks ago, and it generates a Mandelbrot set that is the largest scale you can fit in a Minecraft world. So here we have our first layer is just about 30 blocks by 30 blocks, um, and it lets you see the entire set on screen at the same time. But if I zoom in here with this little zoom in potion, sort of a Alice in Wonderland reference on the, the cup of tea that makes her shrink down, you can zoom in on a spot, and you'll see here we just shifted dimensions. So we're in a different dimension now, where we are zoomed in 10 times further than we were before. And we can keep doing that a few times. So here we're zoomed in another 10 times. And another 10 times. You can see in my hotbar, or I guess above my hotbar, there's coordinates showing where in the complex plane I am, as well as which zoom level I'm at. Um, so yeah, I can just keep zooming in further and further until eventually I get to the sixth layer. And this layer is zoomed in 10 million times further than the initial layer that I started at. Um, so I'm going to just let this generate for a bit while I show off some more of the features of this data pack. Um, you can see in my hand, there's clearly the bottle to make me zoom in. Right-clicking this cake will make me zoom out. It's the same Alice in Wonderland reference to the cake that says, eat me, that makes her grow. Um, if you turn off the creative flight, then holding the cake will make you... Nope, it didn't work. Um, alrighty, the data pack just needed restarted. I'm not entirely sure what went wrong there. Um, so as I was saying, if you turn off creative flight, the potion gives you a slow falling effect, so you have a nice gradual zoom in. And the cake gives you levitation, so you have a nice gradual zoom out. And then this shulker shell cancels out your gravity, so you come to a nice gradual stop. And then additionally, if you zoom out too far with the cake, it will take you to the next dimension out. And similarly, if you zoom in too far with the potion, it will take you to the next dimension in. And that was how I made the animations for the main video a couple of weeks ago. The other items on my hotbar here are this bucket that's mostly for debugging. Um, if you change dimensions too fast, sometimes the generation freezes like it has right now. So I just right click with the bucket and it starts regenerating again. And sometimes you'll get very rarely individual pixels that are messed up. So you just go right over them, right click, and it will restart those as well. The final things in my hotbar here are this POI marking and listing function. So if I find somewhere on the set that I find interesting and I want to come back to later, but you know, it would be very hard to find given this is now an entire Minecraft world, um, I can mark it here. So, you know, I might decide I like this weird amoeba shape. So I right click the mark point of interest. I can then open chat and click this rename button and type in a new name I want to give it. That's probably not how you spell amoeba, but whatever. Um, and so now I have a new point of interest stored. And I can click this button to list all of my points of interest. So here I have a whole list of, list of them. Um, so here is the weird egg thing that I zoomed in on in the 
first video. And see that it, as I generate more and more, you can see the little spiraling egg shapes that are in this part of the Mandelbrot set. Um, a couple of the other points of interest, I have some that are at the borders of the world. Um, so here you can see that I'm at the point uh, negative two on the real plane and zero on the imaginary axis. Um, and this is just the very edge of the Mandelbrot set and the very edge of the world. And the other edge of the world, um, the other end of the world. This is a spot on the opposite side of the Mandelbrot set. I'll just zoom out to give a better perspective of where it is, but this touches the opposite border of the world. Yeah, that is this point right here. And so then this square basically defines what the, you know, bounds are on the farthest zoomed in level. Um, so that's pretty much it for the technical features of this data pack and map. Um, if you want to just explore it on your own, this is all you need to know. And the rest of the video is going to be more of a technical deep dive in how the data pack works. I'm over here in the data pack for the Mandelbrot set world. Um, I'm not going to go into every single little advancement function. Um, a lot of them, like for using the items, are fairly straightforward. But I will go into the world gen for setting up the custom dimensions, as well as the functions I'm using for doing the calculations. So for world gen, we have a couple folders here. We have our dimension type folder and our world preset folder. The dimension type defines a single dimension. Um, so we have these seven here that are all identical, except for this coordinate scale value. And you can see each dimension that is scaled up by 10. This is the um, same thing that the vanilla game uses to make travel in the nether eight times faster than travel in other dimensions. So this zoom level zero here is the dimension that takes the full world border size, and it has a scale of one. And then up here in our zoom six world, we have a scale of 10 million. So that means every one block traveled in the outermost dimension is 10 million blocks traveled in the innermost dimension. Um, other than that, the settings for this dimension are basically the same as the overworld. When we come into this world preset, we define terrain generation and all that. So we start with the overworld, because every world preset needs an overworld. And this one we have as a void dimension. It just has that starting platform with the button. And then we have our seven Mandelbrot dimensions. They're all super flat worlds with 64 layers of concrete, or I guess 65 layers, um, just so that Y coordinate zero is the one that's on the top of the world that has all the changes happening to it, um, just to make the data pack part easier. Um, other than that, these are all exactly the same other than they're referencing different dimension types so they all have the slightly different scale and then finally i have to put a tag that points to that world preset in the minecraft namespace so that when you load this data pack during world creation it will have this world preset show up as an option in the list and with that you can create a new world that even without the um, functions and all that here, would have the seven custom dimensions and the void overworld. Over here in my functions folder, you can see there's a lot going on. 
Before I get into the general loop of how everything works, I want to take a look at these math functions. Um, so my previous Mandelbrot set generators have all used scoreboards, and they've done fixed point arithmetic, which basically means I, you know, do math as though all of the decimal values were integers, and then I just scale them by a set factor. And that runs into overflow issues very quickly, uh, which is why neither of those generators could be much larger than they were. And even the ones I did started running into weird calculation issues. Uh, whereas for this one, I'm doing actual floating point math. There's a handful of ways to do that in Minecraft. Some people have done libraries where they basically implement the IEEE standard for floating point numbers using scoreboards as, you know, basically data registers and then doing floating point math this way. Um, in my case, I'm using attributes because attributes have this nifty function called git that lets you get a double, flo double precision floating point value based on the base and the modifiers to that attribute. So using the luck attribute, which by default doesn't have anything set in game, um, I can do basic arithmetic and get actual floating point results. So in this case for adding, I take value A passed into the macro function, set it to the base of the attribute modifier, or of the luck attribute, I take the second value and add it as a modifier, and then just get the resulting value. Um, this scaling here has to do just with the data get capabilities. Um, whatever is returned from after the run statement is an integer, um, and so I have to scale it up and scale it back down but this doesn't run into nearly as many floating point issues as I was running into with, you know, fixed point arithmetic. The invert function is really straightforward just because for our use case, we're always guaranteed to have a positive value that we're inverting. And so we just use a macro to stick a negative sign on the front and away we go. And finally, multiplying. We take our first value and set it to the base. We take our second value and set it to the modifier with this add multiplied base modifier. And add multiplied base is weird because it takes all of the modifiers, adds them up, and then adds one before multiplying. Um, and so I just have to add a negative one offset. So it adds you know, our single modifier, then adds negative one, then adds one back in, and then multiplies it by the base. Um, so a bit janky, but it works, and we get to multiply two values. The main generation loop starts with this changed dimension function. This triggers when the player moves to any of the custom dimensions, and it calls this changed dimension function. This function will add a tag to the player and then schedule a function for half a second in the future to start generation. This function summons a marker entity that will run the calculations. It also removes the frozen tag from any marker entities that have the frozen tag. Uh, we give those to entities when we change dimensions just to keep things cleaned up and make sure we're not trying to do things in the wrong dimension. Uh, once the markers have been summoned, it comes down to our tick function. This tick function um, creates our little title bar that shows where we are in the world, calls our main step function to run the calculations, and then these other four lines are for zooming in and zooming out. So in this flood step, we choose the 16 nearest markers. Uh, you can try increasing this or decreasing this based on 
how powerful your computer is, but it doesn't really impact a ton what it is. Um, you might be able to just get a little bit faster or a little bit slower. But it chooses 16 to run this function. This function runs the calculations at the marker, then checks in the four neighboring tiles to see if they need to have calculations run, and if they do, it summons a marker entity there. And finally, we kill the entity that just ran the calculations. So now we get into the calculations themselves. We start by getting our coordinates, and we start getting our coordinates by checking which dimension we're in, and we get our xz position, and we scale it by a different factor based on our dimension, and we also use this opportunity to set the number of iterations we're going to do before we decide to give up. Now, once we have those coordinates, we do some math here to um, scale them up and rotate them by 45 degrees. So we scale them up a bit. This is so they're the you know, maximum size for the world border. And then this is rotating 45 degrees, just so we have that little bit of extra space, um, you know, slightly larger than if we stuck to one of the axes to be the real axis. And finally, there's a linear offset. Um, so the you know, center of the Mandelbrot set isn't actually the very center of the world. Um, but again, that's just a shift so that everything stays within that box that is at the world border. Um, so once we have our coordinates, we you know, take get our coordinates, we have an x and y value that we reset to zero, we reset our iteration count, and then we run this looping function. This function starts by calculating our current magnitude. So we get x squared and y squared, um, or our real component squared, and the absolute value of our imaginary component squared, just to get the distance from the center. And if that is greater than 4, we know that we're going to diverge to infinity eventually, so we can stop calculating, and we know how many iterations it took to escape. Otherwise, we add one to our iteration, and we continue running calculations. Um, so you can see the pseudocode for this on Wikipedia. I'll put a screenshot on the screen just to show what's happening, but this is just, you know, running that core Mandelbrot function loop of we square our value and we add the original value back in. And once we've updated x and y, we call the current function again. That goes back to the top. We calculate the magnitude again, and if we've escaped, we leave. Otherwise, we keep looping, looping until we get to that max iteration count. Uh, once we're done, if iteration is greater than equal to max iteration, we set the block under us to black concrete and we exit. Otherwise, we just go through this lookup table, which is probably not the most elegant way to do it, but um, we go through this lookup table and we set it to a different color of either concrete or concrete powder based on how many iterations it took to escape. Thank you all for watching and sticking through that technical explanation. I hope you enjoyed or learned something new about data packs or functions or any of that. Um, if you did enjoy, please consider leaving a like, a comment, or subscribing. And if you want to check out this world, there's a link to Planet Minecraft in the description below, as well as a link to a Discord if you have any technical issues or you find anything cool in the Mandelbrot set that you want to share. But other than that, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you all in the future.